this session, I'm going to talk about Nisim Ezekiel. He, like A.K. Ramanujan and R. Parthasarathy, uh, is one of the better known Indian English poets. Probably Ezekiel is the senior most of these three. He passed away a few years ago. After a very long struggle, he had Alzheimer's. That is what is called an authentic biography of Nisim Ezekiel by R. Raj Rao. Raj Rao is a professor of English at the University of Pune. And he has written this wonderful biography, which I think gives us an insight into the very complex, very imperfect, and very um, turbulent life of Nisim Ezekiel. Ezekiel is well known for many things, but I'd like to concentrate on one or two aspects of his craft. One is his wry sense of humor, a kind of you know, less deceived tone. He's not given to romantic outbursts or lyrical outbursts, and he tries to tone down the enthusiasm. Remember when uh, Shelley sent a poem to Keats, Keats wrote back to Shelley saying, uh, Percy, curb thy enthusiasm and load every rift with oar. A poem has to be beautifully constructed. It's finally an art product. It's both a thing said and a thing made, but it's a thing made. You have to make it. It's like a piece of architecture where every word is in place, where every phrase is thought out. Nothing is adventitious or by accident in a poem. Everything is there because of a certain purpose. So that's what Keats really meant when he spoke to Shelley in those terms affectionately. But Shelley, of course, was a blithe spirit and he was not going to be curbed by anybody. Ezekiel curbs himself. But his life was not a curbing at all. In fact, his very tragic life. And he had so many relationships which came to grief and so many people who have very bitter memories of the man. But be that as it may, there is a difference between the man who suffers and the poet who creates. And Nassim Ezekiel is a man who suffered, but also a poet who created. And I want to concentrate on the creativity of Nassim Ezekiel. The second point I want to make is that Ezekiel uses the English language with great grace. And this is the same poet who could make fun of Indians speaking English, like the goodbye party to uh, Miss Pushpa T.S. I don't have the text with me here, but I've heard Ezekiel himself reading it. And it is so amusing and so funny. At the same time, very serious. It's not as though he's making fun of Indians speaking English in that way. There's also a moral judgment embedded in the poem about people who laugh at people, all right? So he's a deeply moral poet. And I think that's the second point I want to make, that. Here is a poet who uses the language well, but who also uses it because he also believes in some values. So two images is a poem of that kind. It's kind of an imagist poem. And two images are given to us. And each image reflects on the other, comments on the other, and creates a world of significance. So here is just two images. From the long, dark tunnel of that afternoon, crouching, humped, waiting for the promised land, I peeped out like a startled animal and saw a friend flapping his angelic wings. I welcomed him. Fish soul in that silent pool, I found myself supported by the element I lived in, but dragged out with the greatest ease by any fluttering fly at the end of a hook. So two images, clearly part one, part two, two images, one image in each part. In the first part, 
he seems to be like a startled animal who is trapped and who wants to come out of that tunnel and get the light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak. And he sees a friend of his looking for him and then seeking him out. And he looks at the friend and thinks that the friend is an angel with wings, angelic wings. And I welcomed him. In the second part, we have a protagonist who looks like a fish in water, struggling, obviously blithe in its movements, but it's a silent pool and he finds that him, he's supported, the fish is supported by the water, the element in which it lives. So he's like a fish in water, not a fish out of water, all right? That's the beautiful part of it. The fish in water is supported by the element in which it lives. I am in this world quite comfortable and quite settled. That seems to be the point he's making. But then he's also capable of being disrupted. His life can be disrupted. He can be dragged out like a fish can be dragged out of the element by the fluttering fly at the end of a hook, isn't it? So from the long dark tunnel, of that afternoon, look at the number of uh, words which are used here, crouching, humped, waiting for the promised land. Now why would Nisim Ezekiel use the term promised land? Would Indians normally talk of the promised land? We don't normally talk of it. Hindu writers perhaps are not likely to talk about a promised land. Muslim writers may not talk about a promised land, but some writers do. And what do you think is the significance of the promised land here? Yeah. It's that uh, Nizim Ezekiel was a Jew. So yes. he shared this uh, belief the yes. Jews had. Yes. Uh, in the Old Testament, they say that uh, Moses uh, took the people of Israel right. to a promised land where there was absolutely, no misery absolutely. and where everyone was happy. Absolutely. So the Jews were also waiting for their Messiah to come. So it's like uh, the Jew's belief coming in, in this poem where Nazim Ezekiel is waiting for his Messiah to come. Yeah, and the Messiah comes and in the form of a friend with yeah, angelic wings with angelic and I welcomed wings. him, yeah. right? Thank you very much, wonderful. From the long dark tunnel of that afternoon and it's a dark, dark tunnel in an afternoon. The tunnel is dark, the afternoon obviously is bright, okay? Look at the contrasts. From the long dark tunnel of that afternoon, crouching, because you're inside a tunnel, you're crouching, humped, obviously, with your shoulders down like that, waiting in expectation for the promised land. But look at the word promised land for the end of the tunnel. You know, It seems to be a huge meaning given to an ordinary experience of wanting to simply come out of this tunnel and get into the bright lights outside. I peeped out like a startled animal. I saw a friend flapping his angelic wings. I welcomed him. One of the things you can see in this Ezekiel poem is that he seems to be converting human beings into either animals or beasts or insects or whatever. There is some kind of a non-human dimension to human beings, right? Am I right in saying that? Do you think it's a, an exaggerated remark I'm making about this? From the long dark tunnel of that afternoon, crouching, humped, waiting for the promised land, I peeped out like a startled animal. You see, there are many poets, and I can think of a poet like Robert Bly, American poet, or I can think of a poet like William Stafford, and there are a number of poems in the poets in the deep imagist school of America or the Blue Mountain School of Poets who, or Ted Hughes in England. People who think that because human beings have made a mess of their lives, maybe they should learn something from the non-human world. So crows, otters, pikes and uh, you know, foxes might be able to tell you something about life which human beings can't. And so this, this desire to go into the non-human in order to make ourselves more human seems to be a pattern in modern poetry. I'm, I suspect that Ezekiel, who knew his English poetry very well, certainly he knew the English poets like Philip Larkin and Ted Hughes 
on whom he has also written. And I think some of that seems to be, in a way, uh, relevant for understanding some of these animal images which seem to be coming up again and again. After all, the angelic friend comes with flapping his wings, like a bird. Angels, of course, have wings. But then to say flapping his wings is a kind of way of you know, making the friend also look non-human. I, I peeped out like a startled animal and saw a friend flapping his angelic wings. I welcomed him. So this is the first image. And it's a very strong visual impact which, has, which you have, where you see a poet who is talking about being a startled animal trying to come out of a trap. Then you have another image, which is like a cinematic image changing from one to the other. It's almost cinematic in its technique, isn't it? The cinema is very important in, in modern, modern culture, as we all know. And it's had a, a, over a hundred years history now. And the way in which cinema has progressed has also been a fascinating subject for literary people. Many people have used cinematic methods in their narration. The Wasteland by T.S. Eliot is full of cinematic images. And you have one image followed by another, followed by another, constantly you know, um, uh, uh, in interacting with one another, interconnecting with one another to produce a larger significance. So I think Ezekiel has also learned from the cinema the manner in which images can be used, cinematic images can be put together, collated, a collage, and then create a kind of a meaning. The second part talks of the protagonist not as a bird now, not as a startled animal, but as a fish in water, comfortable in the elements. Like most human beings seem to be reasonably comfortable in the world they live in, but there is always danger lurking and there is no, no certainty about our lives. That seems to be Ezekiel's meaning or say, you know, uh, uh, suggestion. Do you have something to say? Can the two images be life and death? Life and death. The first image is about life and the second image can be de death. It is tempting to no. you know, have a larger meaning like that. Okay. It's tempting. I'm not saying one should you know, ignore mm. it. But a dimension like that can be used. But it can be framing. It can be a framing device in which you savor the manner of you know, arriving at that larger meaning. All right? I'm not sure that I would entirely agree with you there though, okay? Fish soul, in the silent pool, I found myself supported by the element I lived in, but dragged out with the greatest ease. Just as a fish can be dragged out without any difficulty by somebody who's fishing, all he has to do is put a bait, a fluttering fly at the end of a hook, and then you capture the fish, or you put a net, and then you have a huge haul of fish for the day, which means that human beings are all the time in a state of some kind of insecurity. And whether it is a startled animal trying to come out of the tunnel or a fish coming out of the water, the net result seems to be a lack of stability in our lives. Is that a, an exaggerated meaning, do you think? I find you're very skeptical about it. Maybe the life and death point which you're making needs to be considered a little more. Would anyone like to comment on that? Any ideas about it? Would you like to elaborate a bit on this? I just thought that um, here the friend comes to you know give him back his life. Yes. And in the next image, I think take it's away still the life. take away you. life. Yeah, I think you have a point. You have a point. But I'm not certain about yeah. myself in this matter. And I think that's part of the beauty of reading poetry that we can't possibly agree on an interpretation one of the dangers, though, which we must be cautious about, is to come up with too much of a, a conceptual framework for a poem. It's very easy to say that a poem has this kind of a framework. You know, the stopping by woods on a snowy evening. Everybody talks about the horse which gives its head a little shake and asking whether there's a mistake and so on. Oh, this is God cautioning, uh, you know, uh, the, the poet uh, against forgetting his duty to the world and forgetting his duty to himself. He should not be stopping and staring at the woods because he has promises to keep, miles to go before he can sleep and so on. The horse is conscience, all right? 
the wheel, red wheelbarrow, it's some agrarian uh, you know, allegory. I think this kind of you know, uh, large scale uh, lifting of the significance of, po of a poem, while it may be true in some cases, cannot automatically be applied to many of the modern poets. And I, if I know something about Ezekiel, I think Ezekiel would be a little wary of allowing himself to be put into or appropriated into what we might call an easy uh, in a framework of allegory. So uh, uh, I accept your point, but with some reservations, okay? After reading a prediction, I think it's a long poem. I think what we should do is read, three people will read three parts of it. So may I ask you, Bhamati, to read the first part? I'm not superstitious. The zodiac predicts a new creative phase of seven years for Sagittarians. I remind myself that to be the healer, not the sick or the indifferent one, was always my ambition. And to rage against the barren, not only in friend or stranger, but perfectly familiar in my own signature. Good. This is the place where I was born. I know it well. It is home, which I recognize at last as a kind of hell to be made tolerable. Let the fevers come, the patterns break and form again for me and for the place. I say to it and to myself, not to be dead or dying is a cause for celebration. Isn't that terrible, that statement? Right, carry on. Watching well. spiders climb the commonplace, ants cooperate, lakes reflect the hills of some remembered holiday, ships and swans engender legends, morals, music. I seek on firmer ground to improvise my later fiction, the fallen world, a faithful friend. I also learn to make light of the process to be the bird in balance on the turbulent air, and yet as present here as any solid human body, heavy, slow, and wishbone, breakable, straining to stay young. Good. Three parts, clearly. And the first part is about being superstitious or not being superstitious, and some predictions. Second part is a, a vicious, almost hard-hitting attack on the idea of home. And the third is about becoming at one with the world, accepting the world for what it is. I think there seems to be some sense of, of positive energy there, but we'll come back to that point. But before we do this, can you just tell me whether in the last but one line, the word wishbone makes any sense to you? Do you know what a wishbone is? A particular part of the chicken leg, children crack it. Okay. It's, it's a age long, Almost a tradition by now. Children crack it and they, they believe that if you wish and make a wish before cracking it, the wish is supposed to come Wonderful. true. Wonderful. And in the dictionary, which I consulted before I came, it says a merry thought. <laughs> All right. It's just a merry thought. All right. But it's right. When you wish for something, obviously you're going to wish for something good. Right? It's all part of this entire poem's culture, isn't it? It's all about predictions. And remember, the poem itself is after reading a prediction. So when you crack the wishbone, it's a wish, it's a prediction of something. You know, you were asking for something. Uh, look at the choice of words. That's what I'm trying to say. A poet is someone who will never use a word without a meaning, without a significance or a purpose. Nothing is there by, by accident, as I said that. Nothing is adventitious. That's a nice word, no? Nothing is adventitiously there. Okay? A new word for you? No? It's all right, you know it. I'm not superstitious. Are you? Are you a Sagittarian? No, what are you? You're a Sagittarian. I'm a Sagittarian too, right. And Sagittarians are supposed to be slightly, you know, romantic in their <laughs> way of looking at life. I'm not superstitious. The Zodiac predicts a new creative phase of seven years for Sagittarians. I remind myself that to be the healer I want to be the healer, not the sick or the indifferent one. I don't want to be a sick or indifferent person. I want to be the healer. I want to be in charge. I remind myself that to be the healer, 
not the sick or the indifferent one, was always my ambition. That's what I wanted to be. And to rage and to be angry against the barren, that which is not creative. Creative surge, he says. Seven years creativity, barrenness. That's the contrast. And to rage against the barren, not only in friend or stranger, but perfectly familiar in my own signature. I want to rage against anything which is uncreative in friend, foe and myself. That seems to be the point here. This is the first movement of the poem. It's a three-phased poem, right? Three parts to it. And there is a movement. And I'm using the word movement almost as though this is a piece of music, Western music, where there are movements and motifs and points and counterpoints and so on. Second, and this is the uh, part which I think is particularly hard hitting, because in one poem of his, uh, Ezekiel said, my backward place is where I am. I love the idea of being in my home. It's a backward place, but that's where I want to be. I don't want to be abroad. I don't want to live in some other country. I just want to go back to the place where I come from. My backward place is where I am. It was a statement of great courage for a poet in English to say that, because every English poet is wanting to rush off to the United States or Canada or some other place and get recognition in those countries. In fact, that's true, isn't it? In Indian English writing, the poet or the writer who gets recognition in India is probably less considered than someone who wins a Booker Prize or one who gets published in, uh, in America or something of the kind. The metropolitan centers of the world have to recognize you before your own country will recognize you. The great exception to all this was Arke Narayan, who published himself. But look at that. This is the place where I was born. I know it well. It is home. And what is home? I recognize it at last as a kind of hell, which has to be made tolerable. Right? It has to be made tolerable. So these are comments on himself. By the way, there's a deeply autobiographical you know, uh, level to this poem. I'm not able to give you all kinds of meanings uh, from his life. And I've been, I began by saying the poet, the man who suffers and the poet who creates are different. But not so different after all. There is some symbiotic relationship between the two. And if you read Raj Rao's biography, you will know that Ezekiel was a terrible husband. And hell, home must have been hell. Not just for him, but for his wife and his family. And I know for a fact that in the last four years when he was in a little um, a hospital in Bombay, his son and wife rarely visited him there. And towards the end, I think they had simply been, you know, they ignored him. That's what many people say. It must have been a terrible personal life. I know it well. It is home, which I recognize at last as a kind of hell to be made tolerable. But quite apart from the autobiographical dimension which I am suggesting, I don't want to press it too much, the fact is that all of us live in uh, lives where there is sorrow and discomfort and unhappiness and we have to learn to make life tolerable. Isn't it Gandhi who said life is suffering? Man is a suffering animal. Suffering is the badge of the human tribe, he said. And it was Hardy who said um, happiness is an occasional interlude in the drama of pain and suffering of the world. Remember that? It's true. World, we are all born here. We are happy enough. We are probably contented, but we know that all around us there is unhappiness and discomfort and anger and, you know, uh, pain. And for us, we have to live in this world and become one with the world. And the only way in which you can do this is to have a positive attitude to life and make life tolerable, as tolerable as possible. If you don't do that, then you become very unhappy yourself. So I think there is a great philosophical meaning also in Ezekiel and in a manner of speaking Ezekiel is also prophesying and telling us all look you have to make life tolerable for yourself otherwise it will be hell. So I know it well it is home which I recognize at last as a kind of hell to be made tolerable and then he says let the fevers come the patterns break and form again for me and for the place it doesn't matter to me let the fever come let the patterns which I've been building up break up let it come again. It doesn't matter to me, for myself and the place I live in. I say to it and to myself, not to be dead or dying 
is a cause for celebration. We have to celebrate life, not to be dead. The fact that I'm not dead, matter of celebration. If I'm only dying, I'm not dead yet. It's also a cause for celebration. That's a very positive attitude to the business of living. And then comes the last movement. And then he looks at nature, spiders and so on. When spiders climb the common place, common place, the wall, a common place enough thing, nothing very wonderful about a wall which is full of cobwebs climbing the common place. Ants cooperate. Have you seen ants going together? Right? They seem to be going to a conference. All of them are together, one on top of the other. If they have seen some sugar somewhere, that's it. They're all together, but in a wonderful straight line. They're, they're so disciplined that I wonder if they could take over the country, our transportation would be better. <laughs> right? Okay. Watching climb, spiders climb the common place, ants cooperate. They cooperate. No other community of animals or, you know, seem to be that wonderful in cooperating, building together, cooperate. Lakes reflect the hills of some remembered holiday. Again, a sad thought. Some holiday, it must have been a pleasant one, and you go somewhere and you see a lake and you see the uh, hills being reflected, you suddenly remember, oh, 30 years ago, I was in Kodak Canal, I was in Uti, and this is what I saw, this is what happened. We quarreled. Some, some personal problems are involved here. Watching spiders climb the commonplace, ants cooperate, lakes reflect the hills of some remembered holiday, ships and swans engendered legends, morals, music, I seek on firmer ground to improvise my later fiction. So when I see these objects of nature, when I see the swans, when I see the ships, I remember that it is possible for us to have a firmer foundation in life because nature tells us something about it. Nature gives us some hope for uh, you know, living life better. Remember the point I made about the earlier poem, that these animal images and so on, the non-human seems to be a suggestion or a kind of a, a lesson for human beings. So to improvise my later fiction, the fallen world, a faithful friend. Why does he say a fallen world? The world in which you and I live is obviously a fallen world from the biblical point of view, isn't it? We all know that Adam and Eve lived in the Garden of Eden and then of course man falls and the Garden of Eden is lost to us, paradise is lost and we are in this world, it's a fallen world, we need to recover paradise, paradise regained. Okay, that's the point here. The fallen world, a faithful friend. As far as Ezekiel is concerned, even though it's a fallen world, I am happy in this world. He's like that. He believes in the fortunate fall. It's good that human beings fell because if they had been too much in heaven, they would have been very boring. You need to have life. You need to have people doing wrong things. You need to have relationships. You need to have turbulence in your life. Otherwise, the world is no good. That's Ezekiel's philosophy here. I also learn to make light of the process, to be the bird in balance on the turbulent air. And yet as present here as any solid human body, heavy, slow and wishbone breakable, straining to stay young. So those three last three or four lines in the, uh, at the end suggest to us that while Ezekiel is very conscious of the fact that he is living in an imperfect world, that he's living in a gross world with a gross body, he needs to balance himself. He needs to learn from the birds how to balance and he needs to break that wishbone and ask for some wonderful future for himself in a world which is not perfect. Does that make sense as an interpretation? Do you have skeptical questions about this? All right, great. I think I'm done for the day. Thank you very, very much.